Hey, um, we're continuing our um, series in Matthew. Some of you didn't, you forgot that we were even in a series on Matthew, but we are. Uh, so flip in your Bibles to Matthew chapter six. Matthew six is where we're gonna pick up the story of Jesus. Now, if you're new to the Bible, you're unfamiliar with the scriptures, Matthew is simply a documentary about the life of Jesus. Uh, there was a documentary uh, maker named Matthew who had, didn't have a video camera, he had pen and paper, and he wrote down uh, the accounts of the life of Jesus, and so that's what we're just looking at. We're looking at an eyewitness account to what Jesus did when he was here and how he lived, and actually, the specific passage that we're in today is kind of a collection, it's a couple chapters of a collection of Jesus' greatest hits, basically. It's like all of his best teachings, all of the most important stuff, all kind of uh, just compacted together within a few chapters. So we're gonna jump in tonight, and I think it's gonna be really fun. The past few gatherings have been pretty interesting. So. Matthew 6, verse 25. Let's read together. Therefore, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you, do not worry about your life. That's easy enough. (laughs) What you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's become a common occurrence for me to be standing up here when we invite any of you down for prayer. And as I begin to talk with the person and figure out what they're looking for prayer for, Um, what really comes to the surface is that their problem or their issue is rooted in a place of unbelief in their life. Uh, I'm a pastor, so I get to meet with people all throughout the week, and it's very common that as I meet with people and they bring an issue to the conversation or a problem or circumstance that's difficult that they're going through, at the very root of the issue is they haven't believed God in a place where God has promised something. I personally have found it true that many of our problems in life, our real true problems, are rooted in a difficulty in believing God where he has made promises or character statements. And so as I read this passage and as I meditated on it, I got a sense that in this new year, 2018, God wants to increase our confidence in his character. As a church and as individuals, he wants to actually strengthen the confidence we have in his character. Because the only way for us to be a non-anxious presence in any situation is for us to live with a deep abiding confidence in God's character and in his promises. Now, what I want you to, to look at is real fast to put this into context is I want you to look at the context of the passage that we just read. That, that even just looking at the chapter headings alone is really helpful to kind of figure out what is Jesus getting at as a whole. So if you just, you can flip back a page or maybe you're all on the same page, but the first chapter heading that I have is giving to the needy. That's what the, the teaching is on. And essentially this teaching, if you were to boil it down, it says this, you have one audience when it comes to your money. Nobody else knows your motives, nobody else knows why you're giving there, or why you're not giving there, or why you're spending there, or why you're saving here, but God knows your motives. 
And so your money and re- your relationship to your money is, is actually between you and God. Um, the next chapter heading that I have is on treasures in heaven, laying up your treasures in heaven. Quite simply, this teaching just says, hey, focus in your life on what will have eternal impact. There are certain things that you can spend all your time and energy and effort on that aren't gonna last. But there are other things that if you focus on them, they will have lasting impact into all of eternity. Um, Look down at your Bibles at verse 24. This is from the previous teaching. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In other words, money is so powerful, it could take the place of God in your life. It has that ability. Um, And then this passage today that we're looking at, which essentially boiled down is this. Don't worry about what you need or what you want. God cares about it too. He cares about it too. I, I love what Jesus does here because it's so different than how we tend to talk about the material world around us. But instead of Jesus saying, hey, all material desire is bad and why aren't you more spiritual? What he does is he refocuses our relationship with the material to take place in the context of a trusting heart and a good father. That's what this passage is about. So I just have a couple thoughts for you this evening. Um, If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write it down. Uh, The first is this, God's character and our confidence. God's character and our confidence. Look down at your Bibles again. Let's read this one more time. Verse 25, it says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? I think at the core of this passage, God is saying this, you understanding his love for you has the ability to remove your anxiety. I know, like for some of you, you're like, that's good. For some of you, you're like, Um, no, (laughs) you don't know my anxiety. No, what this passage is saying is that God's care and love for you has the ability to take away your anxiety if you understand it. Um, I did a little bit of study, studying about anxiety um, as I was preparing for this message, and I came across this study that it was done in 2013. It said one in six Americans um, is on some form of medication for their anxiety, which is a lot of people. Um, But what that doesn't take into account is is the vast number of people who aren't taking anything for their anxiety, but they're just living with it. They're dealing with it. Some of you, even in this room right now, you are having anxiety right now because I'm starting to talk about anxiety. You're like, can you just stop? No, 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 don't talk about anxiety anymore, right? Or or some of us, we have anxiety as we drive to work and we think about that person that we're gonna have to see there as we go to the next family gathering. You're like, I just hope that person doesn't show up and there's this this anxiety that comes up to the surface. Anxiety is a big deal and many of us live with it on a daily basis. Um, For many people, I think anxiety stems from this process that can happen internally that we don't even realize has, has taken place. Uh, it, it tends to go like this. There's a situation or an issue that arises that's new. You get the phone call. You have the conversation. You turn on the news. And all of a sudden, there's fear about what could happen. What if, about multiple outcomes? What if this happens? Or what if that happens? Or I hope that doesn't happen. And so instantly you're filled with this desire to control the outcome. I gotta control this outcome. I gotta make sure that doesn't happen. I gotta make sure that this does happen in my life. And then all of a sudden, almost in a split second, you have a realization. You maybe didn't even know you had a realization, but you realize you can't control the outcome. Or if you're gonna control the outcome, it's gonna take an incredible amount of effort and you just don't have the energy. And so then all of a sudden you're filled with anxiety about your lack of control of that situation or that circumstance. Jesus says, don't be anxious. And he doesn't say, hey, I understand that you're anxious. Everybody gets anxious every now and then. And he doesn't say, I'm really sorry that you're anxious. He says, don't be anxious. How? 
How can we not be anxious, especially in the world that we live in? I mean, we live with a constant stream of 24-7 news that's all bad. How, how can I not be anxious? Our relationships are more disconnected and complicated than they've ever been. How can I not be anxious? There, it's, it's more, the cost of living continues to rise. How can I not be anxious? Will I end up with that person? How can I not be anxious? Will this situation ever get better? How, how can I not be anxious? Well, there's this weird truth at play here that is a challenge to me and I think it will be a challenge for you as well. You see, the Bible calls you a believer. And what does a believer do? A believer believes things, right? And it is actually, I don't know if you know this, it is in your nature to believe God. Did you know that? Uh Um. (laughs) Uh-oh. See, when you, uh, yeah, okay. So when you came into Christ, your old life died. Did you know that? So there was a point in your life where you were constantly anxiety-ridden because there was nobody who cared for you but you. Um, You were living in, in sin. God rescued you, and you stepped over a line of demarcation, and you became in Christ. That's a theological truth about you. And when you became in Christ, your old life died. And you now, it is now in your nature to believe God. When God promises things, when he says things about his character, it is in your nature as a son or daughter of the king to believe God. But there's a lot of us who were a little bit more comfortable with our old nature. And so we actually go back to it. It's sort of like this. I heard this example, and I just think this is, a great example. It would be like if you sold a car on Craigslist. You post your car up on Craigslist, you sell it, and it happens to actually sell to a guy who lives a couple streets over from you. This is your neighbor. And a couple months goes by, you don't really miss the car too much, you made the sale, it was a good thing, but you're rummaging through some old things and you come across a pair of keys to the car. And all of a sudden you get a little bit sentimental, you think, man, it's been a long time since I drove that car. I had a lot, a lot of good times in that car, man. That was really fun. You know, I know where it is. So I'm just going to go down there. I'm going to take it for a spin. It's been a while. Do you know what that's called? That's called stealing. <laughs> that's stealing. And here's the deal. Jesus paid a price to get rid of your past. So when you go back and you live as though you are the old persons, you're stealing from God. You're stealing your old past. You have no, you have a, there's a legal right that says you don't have a right to your past. You don't have a right to live like you used to live. And so there's a challenge to all of us to when we read things in the scripture, we get, we've gotten rid of the old man filter and we now live as the new man and the new woman and we live with a new filter. And it's whatever Jesus says is truth because he said the truth would set me free and the way I used to live wasn't very free. And it seems to me that there is this natural law in the world that the more your faith increases, the more your peace increases. And the, but the more you try to control and realize that you can't control, the more anxiety you get. Have you experienced this? The more you control in your life, the more you feel like you could lose, right? I'm trying to manage all of these different situations to work out the way that I need them. I I have so much to lose. But the more that you surrender and you say, I I don't even, I can't control how this is even gonna look, so I'm gonna give it to you, Lord, the more you begin to live in peace. Why is that? Well, I believe it's because Jesus said this. He said, if you love your life, you'll lose it, but if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. It's almost like he is the truth. (laughs) Or in the language of Isaiah, I really love this. This is Isaiah uh, chapter 26, verse three. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are focused on you because they trust in you. 
Love that passage. You see, the renewing of your mind is something you can participate in daily by choosing to believe God. This is, uh, that's not a part of my nature anymore. It's my nature to believe God. That's what I'm gonna do, and it renews your mind, and it keeps you in perfect peace. Now, Jesus also turns our attention to nature to prove his point. So look down at your Bibles, verse 26. He says, look at the birds of the air. If you're feeling anxious next time, just look at some birds, Right? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? In other words, God cares about your life. If God cares about birds, how much more is he gonna care about you? Consider the birds. They don't sow or reap. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have ever thought much about seeds, but I think about seeds because I, I, it's really, I'm not a scientist, so if you are, you're like, man, that guy's so dumb. Well, listen, I'm not a scientist, but I, you know, it's a tiny piece of dead matter that if you plant it in the right place, it grows into something you can eat. That's crazy. Like, that's insane that we live in a world where you can take something that's dead and you can plant it in the ground and it all of a sudden grows into this huge thing. That's incredible. This is a miracle, I think. And the birds, they don't even participate in that miracle, right? They're not sowing, they're not reaping, they're not doing any of that, yet they still eat. So how do they survive? How does a bird actually survive? These are the deep questions I asked myself as I was studying this passage. Um, my wife and I, for uh, this is a, a number of months ago, we thought about getting chickens. That's as far as we got. We thought about it. We're like... Let's, let's entertain the idea of chickens. That's how far we got into farming. So anyway, we're thinking about chickens. <laughs> and I started, I started wondering, what is a free-range chicken? Like, what does that actually mean? What does it mean to have a free-range chicken? And so, like, wh who feeds that chicken? Do I leave it up for them? They got a range? Or, like, what is ranging? I don't know. So anyway, I started reading about chickens. And I found out that chickens are able to find little tiny pieces of food, like seeds and nuts and all kinds of little things that are on the ground that you would never know are there. So you can just toss them in your backyard, hopefully you have a fence, and you can just let them roam around. And that's why a chicken, its whole life, spends its, like they just do this. They're just <laughs> nodding their head toward the ground because they're finding tiny little pieces of food that you didn't even know was there. And it's almost like in this grand ecosystem where there are people who are planting and sowing and they're, they're dropping a seed there and they're dropping something there. It's like God's like, oh yeah, I thought about the birds too. Even they are fed. I'm reminded, if God is willing to do that, I'm reminded of the point where Jesus says, if as an earthly father you know how to give good gifts, how much more does your father in heaven know how to give good gifts? If he provided for birds, he'll provide for you. Very simple. Now, the first time I read this passage, I remember thinking to myself, okay, well, don't get your hopes up because it says he'll only give you what you need. So, you know, you need to get used to the Spartan sort of lifestyle and no extravagance, right? Because it's plain right there. It says he knows what you need and he'll give it to you, right? And I'm sure that that is the case. I believe that God provides what we need and that he's interested in that. Um, but, but think about this. If the creator was only interested in giving you what you need, why would, you, why would there be any sort of variety when it comes to food? Right? Because think about that. These are things I actually think about. You're getting like an insight into my mind. It's, I know it's dark. Uh, <laughs> like, wow, do you think about this? Like, if if, if God was only interested in giving us what we needed, why didn't he just create little protein blocks for us to eat? And that's it. Like, he's like, oh, okay, listen. Manual for being human, you have five blocks in the morning for breakfast, you have two blocks for lunch, and you have six blocks for dinner. That's it. And so we don't like meals. We're just like, oh, yeah, no, I just gotta take my blocks real fast, and then I'm ready to go. Why is there variety? My wife and I, last night, we have a Jerusalem cookbook, and it is awesome. It has all these great recipes in it, and we just flipped through it. We found two recipes last night, and we cooked something. We would have incredible different flavors I've never had before. Amazing. Many of you guys have traveled around the world. You've tried different types of cuisine. There is no reason if God is only about supplying just what you need for him to give you variety in food, but he does. Or, or imagine this. You know, we just had Christmas, so how fun would it be if you woke up on Christmas morning 
and you're all excited. It doesn't matter how old you get, you still get excited. And you go under the tree, and you see a present for you, and you start to unwrap it, and this is what you unwrap. And you're like, a box of matches? What? And your dad's like, well, hey, listen, I'm interested in supplying what you need, so it could get cold out there someday, and you may need to start a fire. You're welcome. You're like, thanks. Uh, so then, but then there's another present, and you're like, oh, okay, great, there's going to be another present. And you go and you open it up, and you get nail clippers. What? And you're like, what? I, I wanted an Xbox. I didn't want nail clippers. And your dad's like, you don't need an, an Xbox. You're about to go to college, and it's not acceptable to not trim your nails. So you needed some nail clippers. You're like, thanks, Dad. And there's one more present under the, under the tree, so you open it up, and what do you find? You find celery. And you're like, what the? I hope they're hiding like a present for me somewhere, because what is this? And your dad's like, listen, you have to eat, and this is a great food. You're going to burn calories while you eat it, <laughs> and so it's going to sustain you, but it's also going to keep you trim. You're welcome. Like, that's the worst Christmas ever, right? See, if your dad only gives you what you need, your relationship with him never gets beyond what is serious and practical. But if you wake up on Christmas and you unwrap those gifts and you get what you actually wanted, how many of you guys know you have a dad who is extravagant, who goes beyond what you need? And what, if you have parents who did that for you, wouldn't God be better? Like, wouldn't God be the kind of dad who gives you a puppy for Christmas? Wouldn't that be great? This is what I got for Christmas. That's my new dog, Nora. And she's amazing. She's incredible. This, you know, in a lot of ways, a puppy is the opposite of being practical. You know, they pee everywhere. They keep you up at night. She's actually a pretty good dog. But so you got to take that down. Otherwise, uh, nobody's going to pay attention to the rest of the message. So God doesn't just dwell in what is practical. See, if this passage was only about what we needed, wouldn't the examples about what people worry about just be food and water? Why clothing? Why is clothing thrown in there? It's not simply about need. It's about a God who goes above and beyond to bless his kids. I, I, I love this. The example he gives, like the, the, like the, the, the bar that he sets is Solomon. He's like, and I go above and beyond Solomon for you. Solomon was one of the wealthiest kings in the Old Testament, just this incredibly powerful person. And look at your Bibles. It says this in verse 28. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? He's like, oh yeah, you see Solomon, you see the flowers, I go above and beyond for you. Wow. Notice also just grammatically how this passage works. It's, it's really amazing. Look at verse 25 again. He says, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Now, notice this. It's what, not will. The, the worry isn't, will I eat, God? Will I drink? Will I have anything to wear? It's what. Which the question, the implication of it, is that God is even interested in the type. What type will we eat? What type will we drink? What type will we wear? He goes above and beyond. And now, before you get there, this is not a recipe for materialism. The whole purpose of this passage is to show you the goodness of your Father, His extravagance towards you, so that you can actually rest. So that you can rest. So my next question is this. Where does your abundance in life come from? The good material things that you own, where, where do you find their source? Jesus says in verse 31 this. He says, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow 
for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I can almost imagine the tone of Jesus' voice in this passage like, hey, don't worry, it's okay. It's okay. Almost like comfort in a child who's distraught. And so I, I think the primary concern of this passage is rooting your blessing in his character instead of your worry and your concern. Here's what I mean by that. Um, when I moved to Portland, I was 23 years old, just moved into the city. I'll, I remember where I was driving, actually, when this happened. I was driving up by the art museum, and I'm looking around at all the, 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 the huge buildings, and, and just, I don't know about you, but where I grew up, there wasn't as much wealth as there is here in the city of Portland. I'm like, wow, people drive those kind of cars. Like, everybody drives a, a Land Rover. I didn't know that, that you could do that. And just like everything, there was so much wealth around me. And I remember there was this this weird thought that came into my mind. And it was this. It's dog eat dog. Who will care about you if you don't? Who will care about you if you don't? And so I I began to think, oh my gosh, that's true. I mean, look at all, everybody else has seemed to have gone out and get and gotten blessing for their life or or gotten material wealth wealth for their life. And so nobody's going to do it for me, so it's up to me to make my life comfortable. Why, why would that be something that comes into my mind? Well, this is the narrative of our culture because that's how it works in a world that is absent of God. You see, material possessions are badges of honor that speak to how good at life we are. Your abilities to work hard or the connections that you have with the right people or the gifts that you have in life have all earned people in our culture, different material possessions that act as trophies. But what can happen when you begin to think that way, and what happened to me as I began to think that way, is you begin to see life as a competition instead of as your purpose to be blessing the people around you. When the stuff that you have in your life, the material possessions you have, when you believe that you've generated those things, why would you be generous? Because if you did it, so should they right? See, where you get your blessing really matters. So let me ask you a question. It's kind of a difficult question, but let me ask you this. Do you believe tonight that God is more interested in blessing you than you are interested in being blessed? Because he is. Some have become cautious at this point because we would never want to use our relationship with God as a means for us to get material possessions, and that's a good inclination. But if I pivot from asking God for provision in my life because I think it might be selfish or materialistic, if I pivot from that to going out and trying to get what I need without ever consulting my Father, the blessing that could have come from him and moved me to praise, now wars with my affections, and that becomes a recipe for idolatry. You see, there is a difference between the abundance that you go out and get for yourself and the blessing that you simply receive from God. The things that I go out and I get for myself, they speak to me about my ability, right? When I look at them, I think, oh, well, I remember when I was able to do that. I remember when I was able to get that. But the gifts that I receive from God speak to me about his ability. The material items in your life that you have, I believe, should prophesy to you. You're like, what does that mean? Here's what it means. I can sit on my bed and I can look around my room and I can look at the good material things that the Lord has brought into my life and they speak to me about what he's done in the past and about what he's gonna do in the future and they strengthen my faith. Um, In particular, we have this painting um, that sits right next to our bed and a couple years ago, we had all this student debt. Some of you guys have had student, you have student loans still, you know, like, I know he's going to have student loans. I, I was in a position where I thought, we had so much student debt, I thought, we'll never get out of debt. We'll just have debt forever. Doesn't everybody have debt forever? That's just how you live, right? And I thought, I was like, I'm, we're debt guys. That's what we are. We just have debt. <laughs> and, um, 
At the same time, I, was, I had been saving up for a down payment for a home. Was, you know, this is a, a number, a couple years ago. So, you know, housing prices are expensive in Portland. I think, man, if we're ever gonna buy a home in Portland, it's gonna be hard. So we gotta start saving now. So, you know, I saved more money than I'd ever saved in my whole life for our home. It wasn't a lot of money, but for me, it was a lot of money at the time. And... So I'm like, we're making like barely even minimum payments on our debt. We're just kind of like, well, we'll always have it. And very, very clearly the Lord spoke to me and convicted me. And he said, Alex, take all of your money for your home savings and put it towards your debt. I was like, no. (laughs) No, 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 no. That's not how it works. You don't understand. I have to be responsible, Lord, with my money, right? You want me to be responsible? So I have to save so that we can eventually have, like, a family, right? Because we can't live in, like, 700 square feet forever, right? So I'm like, no, I, okay, okay, listen, I'm not gonna do that, but I'll pay a little bit towards it, right? I'm gonna, I'll make you a deal. And he's like, no, no, no. You, (laughs) he's like, you have a responsibility to pay what you owe. I'm like, oh, fine. So I remember the day of like taking that money and it just takes a click. It like transfer and it like all over. And you know when you pay for debt, nothing happens. It's like the number went down, but it's still like out, there's a number out there in the universe that I owe or whatever. So, you know, so we do it. And this started us on this year-long journey of paying all of our debt off in a year. And we, I really, truly thought at least 10 years. And um, there, throughout this whole year, there's this, my wife and I love art. I studied it in college. And we have just wanted to fill our home with art. So w- there was this gallery that we like to go to, and we found this painting there. And this is in the midst of all of this, and we're like, oh, well, you know, it's not that much. Maybe we could just not pay on our student loans this month, and we could get this painting. And we're like, no, 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 no. We're going to, no, the Lord has asked us to do this. We're going to do it. So we keep on going. But we visited this, play, this gallery like three or four times, and we see this painting. It's beautiful. And we're, I mean, it's very rare for me to see a painting. I'm actually like, I need to own that. And we're like, wow, it's really amazing. So anyway, so <laughs> if you were to, take our incomes and then take our debt, it wouldn't make sense that we could pay all of our debt off in a year and still survive as human beings. And the reason why we were able to do it is because God consistently blessed us that year. People gave us, we got money, we had gifts, we even had like our insurance companies like, oh, we owe you this money, here's a check. okay, Uh, like all kinds of crazy like little things that when we just said, okay, but we're gonna do what God wants to do because here's the thing, how many of you guys know that God's will is like, I was thinking about this, it's like when you're playing Mario Kart and and there's those little roads that are like, they will boost you if you go on them, they're like super speed and when you scoot over to them, it just like totally accelerates. When you just do what he wants to do, you accelerate through things way faster than humanly possible. And so we're just like, okay, we're gonna do what you want us to do and he's like, one year and you're done. And so you know what we did at the end of that year? We went and we bought that painting and it's in our house. And every day I get to look at it, and every day, I, your thing should prophesy to you. Every day I look at it, and it speaks to me, not about my ability, but about what he did in our lives. And every time we go through a difficult season, we just say, look at it. If he did it then, why wouldn't he do it now? See, oftentimes we can look in our past and we can see the fingerprints of God all over all different sorts of things, but when we look to our future, it's like we imagine our future without him. We need to start to be the people who imagine our future with him. So do you have things in your life that prophesy to you? See, it's not just, like materialism is, is making something that's material your God. This is not materialism. This is saying that the good things in my life that are material, they represent a spiritual relationship that I have with my heavenly Father. They mean so much more than just stuff. 
But some of us, and me included, we have things in our lives, items in our lives, that they remind us of mistakes made. And, and, and personally, I have things in my life that remind me of the disappointment of getting that thing in my life not being infinitely better from that object. And ultimately, that item or that thing trying to get position of Lord in my life. The point is that there are things that when we receive them with gratitude from the Lord, recognizing him as the source of our blessing, um, they actually become blessings and reasons for praise. But there are other things that when you go out and of your own effort and of your own toil and of your own anxiety and worry, when you get them, all they represent is your anxiety and your toil. And what Jesus is doing is he's recalibrating our hearts in this passage and our relationship with material things and saying it all comes through relationship with the king. Because to seek first the kingdom is to put the king as the primary desire of your life and to leave the blessing up to him so you can rest. So I just really want to ask you this tonight, deep down, where does the blessing, the material blessing in your life actually come from? Because this passage says it comes from your father. Now, you may be sitting there and you think, okay, all that is real and good, but, but what, if, what if you're here tonight and you are like, I have been seeking the kingdom, I think, but I don't, think, I don't feel like I have all I need. What if you don't feel you have what you need? Maybe you're here today and if you were to be honest, 2017 was really difficult. Um... And life has been really difficult, and you aren't in a place where you can trust him to provide for you. As a believer, as believers, we're challenged with the ever-present task of choosing what will shape our worldview. You see, without a sacred text or without a book of wisdom to live by, the rest of the world is left to shape their worldview through their experience. And so through our experience, we shape our worldview oftentimes. We, we spend time with a specific group of people and we think, oh, that's just how they all are. And we codify it as a filter. And it's the way that we begin to see everything else and any other person that could potentially be from that group for the rest of our lives. Or, or, or we even have these personal narratives that we begin to live into, like nobody cares about you. And so for your whole life, you have this idea that you're not going to ever be cared about. Or you go off to college and you interact with a specific race or group of people, and the narrative that you hear is you should be afraid of them. And so then you begin to codify it into your filter and into your worldview. But here's the deal. We're the people of God, so experience can't be the arbiter of truth in our lives. We not only have a sacred text, but we have a God who dwells with us, so we're not supposed to shape our worldview through our experience, but we're supposed to shape our worldview around what the scriptures say to be true. This is challenging, but this is necessary for us to become the people of hope. This message for me is really like, I, felt, I feel like it's coming out of my life because of the past season that my wife and I have been in, and just the other night we declared it's an end to that season. We're like, we're not gonna live in that anymore. Um, But we've had, if you're close to us, you know, we've had just like an incredibly difficult time with our cars and with our money in the past couple months. Just totally random. Um, And it may sound minor to you, but for us it's been a really big deal because my wife and I, we've been saving to pay out of pocket for her to go to nursing school. It's been something that we've been working towards and she's been working incredibly hard towards for the past few years. And so finally it's time for her to go to nursing school. She's done all of her prereqs. She became a, a CNA and did unspeakable things in a nursing home. Uh, I can't even tell you about them. They're bad. Um, all because she has a dream to become a nurse. And so anyway, we had this old car, this old Subaru. I got it when I was 16, and it lasted a long time, like 250,000 miles. It was great, and we thought, this thing's going to keep going. Just put oil in it, right? And so we did. I'm putting oil in I know a little bit about cars, so I'm like, oh, this should be fine. But it's an old car, and long story short, the engine started overheating, and it cracked. And you just, there's no coming back. Well, there is coming back from that, but I don't want to come back from that. So anyway, (laughs) we send it to the junkyard. We get rid of it, right? But now we need to buy a new car. So we're like, you know, this is a bummer, but the setbacks happen. And so, you know, we had saved all this money for school, but you know, we need to to get a new car. 
So anyway, we, I do my research. I'm like, oh, I find this great car that we're going to buy. I go, it's a Craigslist deal. I'm like never buying off Craigslist again. It's been so crazy. So, but anyway, we go up to this guy's house to see the car. And I'm like, wow, looks good, sounds good, runs good, this is great. I'm looking at the receipts. You know, you gotta look at the receipts. Have they done the, the service that they were supposed to do? It has everything, it's great. I'm like, this is awesome. We end up having dinner with this guy and like hanging out with his family for a little bit. Like, it's totally weird Craigslist deal. So, <laughs> we drive it home. It's like a half an hour drive. And when we get home, it's overheating. And we're like, what? Like, we just had a car that was overheating, and we bought like a 12-year newer car, and it shouldn't be overheating. Like, what is going on? And so I pop the hood, and there's coolant spraying out of the overflow bottle. Like, most of you don't know what, about cars because you live in Portland, but I'm telling you, <laughs> that's a bad thing. Like. It's bad if your coolant is coming out of the car. So I'm like, oh my gosh. So you, you know like you, when you can like, I have a headache into Google and you find out you're dying? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm serious. This is what happened. I'm like, coolant is spraying out. They're like, car's gonna blow up. Get out of your garage. I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh. So, <laughs> so I'm like, I text the guy. Hey, can you take this car back? He's like, but long story short, essentially, no, your name's on the title. I'm like, oh, no. So we just drained our savings for, for a car that doesn't even work? I'm like, oh, gosh, this is so bad. I'm looking at my wife. I'm like, I've made some bad financial choices in life. I'm so sorry. I can't believe this just happened. So anyway, we got all this stuff. Long story short, my wife in, is, we're, we're, we have lots of conversations about this whole thing. And, oh, but, and then, sorry, it keeps on going. Um, then our other car that we have, we have two cars, our other car, it doesn't start. All of a sudden it just doesn't start. We're like, why is this not starting? I'm like, oh, it must be the fuel pump. It's an old car. So I'm like, oh, I'll take it in to get the fuel pump changed. It's not the fuel pump. I'm like, oh, I should have done some more diagnosing before I spent all that money on the fuel pump. But anyway, so we keep on going through it. I end up driving, Ryan Majarian was here last week, last uh, service. I end up driving his mom's minivan for, for like three weeks, like a 1999 white Chrysler minivan. I'm in it, cruising around Portland. It got bad, all right? So throughout this whole experience, I'm like, it's hard. I'm like, this, maybe it doesn't seem like a big deal. Everybody has car issues, I know, but this is the trouble that we were in. I'm like, and, and we had this goal, and it just doesn't seem like we're going to meet it. It's this whole thing. So I'm talking with my wife, and she's like, you know, it is our job as followers of Jesus, to live on what is true even and not even on what might make sense about the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And then she says, we're going to shake the tambourine before we get to the promised land. I'm like, what? What does that even mean? I'm like, I'm like, is that in here? It's in there. It's in there. Before Israel gets to the promised land, they celebrate the victory that God is going to bring them before they, it even exper they experience it. Why? Because they're the people of faith. We're people of faith. We believe God even before we've experienced the resolution. See, what my wife is getting at is something that is incredibly powerful and valuable to God, and it's this. It's a sacrifice of praise. The reality is that you can give God a sacrifice of praise in this life that you will never be able to give him in the next. You see, in heaven, there will never be a question about whether you should worship him or not. There will never be unfortunate circumstances that happen to you that make you question his goodness. His glory and goodness will be ever present before you, and you won't wonder if you should worship or not. You'll just worship. But there are things that happen in this life, whether they're as minor as a car thing or as big as somebody in your family being sick or you being sick, that can cause you to question his goodness and thus not worship him. So when you go through difficulty in this life and you choose to worship in the midst of it, you are giving God such a valuable treasure, one that you can never give him in any other life. 
And so what we did, I, lo- I love worship. We got, we, we're gonna worship over the circumstance. We're gonna sing over it. We're gonna sing the victory before we get to it. I'm going back, you guys know this, I have a journal and I have stories written down of things that God has done here on a Sunday, things God does through my life, prophetic words that people speak, and I'm just going over those stories and meditating on them and just saying, God, do it again. You say, you've done this in the past, you'll do it in the future, do it again. See, my ability to believe in God's character, even when things are difficult, positions my heart to quickly receive blessing and live in peace. Instead of me constantly going back and forth on whether he's good or not, and thus having to work through my issues with him before I can receive the breakthrough that he has for me. See, the entire thrust of this message is that God is good enough to care for you. What he provides for you in life is not the point, but it is evidence of the greater reality, which is his love for you. God's love can remove anxiety by increasing your confidence in his character. So that's my prayer for 2018. Let's all stand up together. I wanna just read something over you real fast. So as you stand up, you can go ahead and just close your eyes, and um, I just have a story I wanna read over you before we close. I want you to imagine with your eyes closed a couple A couple who can't have children, imagine the sleepless nights, the emotional pain, the desire unfulfilled. Imagine they go through the adoption process to finally grow their family, and after having the baby for 24 hours, the birth mom decides to not go through with the adoption. They're crushed. Imagine a year goes by and they apply again for another child. The cost has been significant. They've emptied their savings now twice and there is a sneaking suspicion that they are once again being irresponsible with their money and hearts. They don't know if this will go like the last time they attempted to adopt, but they keep pushing. The baby is born and they're invited to meet the baby. Instantly there's a mix of love and fear all together. Everything in them is attaching to the child as they hold her, but in their minds they keep thinking, don't get attached, don't get attached. A day goes by, then two, then three, and finally the paperwork is signed and they get to bring their new baby girl home. They have a daughter. Now what will they do for this girl in her life? Will they suddenly think about her as just lucky to have been adopted constantly comparing her current life with what could have been if they hadn't stepped in? Will they only give her hand-me-downs? Will they never decorate her room because it's just not in the budget? Will she eat cheap food while the parents dine in splendor? No. You see, the price they paid for this girl was representative of the love they have for her that can't be depleted through being given, but in fact grows when it is given. See, if you can right now in this moment imagine how much, imagine how much those parents love that girl, how much more does God continue to sustain and lavishly pour out blessing on you even after he paid the initial cost of his love for you? Quite simply, the love of God is the good news of the Bible. God loved you and was willing to pay any price for you, so he died for you. Jesus bought you not just to save you from death, but to actually make you a son or a daughter in the kingdom, a part of the royal family. His payment didn't deplete the resources of heaven. Instead, it became a reminder of the value a son and daughter of God deserves throughout the entirety of their lives. That is how much he loves you, enough so that you don't have to worry about the material needs of your life as well.